Hello, everybody, and welcome to Welding with Dia. This is day two. Um, if you are coming back and joining me again from yesterday, welcome back. And if you are new, welcome. I am so excited to have you here. We are going to continue making a welding project that we started yesterday. And I'm anticipating that in this session, we're going to be able to finish it and move on to another very cool project. So the project that we're going to be finishing up is this kitchen stool. Simple, funky. Uh, and oh, have my. Um, my moderator, Julia, is just messaging me. Um, I just wanted to say uh, that throughout this entire um, uh, that throughout this entire event, anyone who has any questions, just type them into the chat box and Juliet is going to flag me down if I'm over there making noise and I don't see them. So I'll just come right on over and answer all the questions that you have as and when they come up. I'm going to be going back and forward, talking both about what I'm doing and then also talking about the process itself so that you can learn a little bit about welding, metal fabrication, and what goes on when you're making different things and objects. So the first type of process that I'm gonna be doing today is a MIG welding process. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what is welding. Welding is when you take two separate pieces of material and you fuse them together to create one piece of material. So if you do your job right as a welder and you cut through the seam of your material, it's one full piece. So you've actually changed both the form and the structure of the material itself, which is just so wild to think about. And that's why it's such a powerful process. You can truly make anything that you can think of or dream of. So let's talk a little bit about the MIG welding process, since that's what I'm going to be starting doing today. There are two different types of welding. There's gas welding and electric welding, kind of like a kitchen stove. The types of welding we're going to be doing today are electrical welding processes, MIG welding and TIG welding. I'll talk about the other processes later, but let's talk about MIG to start off. MIG welding is one of the most accessible types of welding. It's um, easier to learn and you are able to do it with mild steel, which is the most common material um, that you can manipulate and use to build different objects and processes. The kitchen stool we're going to be making today together is mild steel. So that's the MIG welding process. What happens when you pull that trigger on your MIG welder and the bright welding arc starts are three different things. First, your electricity flows. So if you've ever jumped a car and seen that little blue lightning bolt in between the car batteries, that's what it looks like when you close a circuit. Um, uh, have some questions coming in that I'll get to in a moment after I finish this explanation. So that little blue lightning bolt is what we call the welding arc. Um, that arc is what we manipulate and it's incredibly hot. It's from seven to 11,000 degrees. So it immediately melts up your, met melts your metal, creating a molten pool of material that you're able to manipulate with your electrode as you weld along. The second thing that happens is that a filler material spools out. So next time you're walking down the street, look at the world around you and look at, you know, the benches and the lamp posts and stuff like that. And you'll see the little raised weld bead. The reason the weld bead is raised is because you're actually looking at the filler material that's been added. That's going to make your material that much stronger. Um, the third thing that happens is a shielding gas flows out. So you're going to see some bottles in the background connected to my welders. That shielding gas flows all the way through down to my welding torch and creates a little cloud of gas around my welding torch, protecting the molten metal from contaminants in the, ox in the atmosphere around it, especially oxygen. When metal is in its molten state, it wants to bond with oxygen and create a compound called iron oxide. That's just a fancy word for rust, and you definitely do not want any kind of rust in your weld. That's the basics of how MIG welding works. 
definitely ask follow-up questions if you want me to talk a little bit more about any aspects of that process. And once you start seeing it happen, hopefully it'll become a little bit more clear to you. Okay, I have a question here. Will um, you use Azure machine learning um, to weld stuff? Um, not today. Nope, today is uh, super simple. I'm just doing uh, MIG welding, TIG welding, and then later on I'm going to be doing oxy acetylene. Okay, so let's get started on this stool. Um, hopefully you guys can see well enough. All right, so again, here's the kitchen stool. I just have to add on this last piece of the stool. So you can see this fourth piece will finish the stool. What you're about to see me do is I'm going to lay that fourth piece I just showed you on the table and then I'm going to use a ton of different clamps to clamp up my piece strongly so that when I weld it I don't get any warping or distortion in my metal. Um, welding is all about heat management and if you don't manage your heat properly um, you will get welds that are more likely to fail and also lots of distortion and warping in your piece. Um, we're, you know, trying to make a kitchen stool that we can sit on, and so we don't want it to be warped and all out of, out of joint. So, let me go and fire up the welder. <laughs> Hazards of a welding shop. Okay, I'm going to put on my awesome welding sleeves. There's a lot of PPE in welding. Funnily enough, looking at the welding arc is like looking at the sun. So that's why I'm going to be putting on that welding hood that I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. And I make sure that I have long sleeves to not only protect me from the sparks that I'm going to be throwing out, but also because I actually emit UV rays when I weld. So if you're not careful, you can get sunburned while you're welding. Crazy. All right, folks. I turn it off when I'm over there talking with you guys 
and I keep trying to weld with the welder up. And if there's one thing you should take away from today's session, is that if you try to do an electrical welding process with no electricity, it's not going to work out for you. All right, folks, let's get this done. of welding. So you want to clamp all your piece up and together and then you just do little dots of weld all over the piece to make sure that your piece doesn't warp when you do the bigger final welds. Again, we're getting back to that heat management, which is what welding is all about. So we manage our heat properly by dispersing little bits of weld all over the piece so that when we go and weld it together, it's not going to warp on us. OK, let's answer some of these questions. Um, ooh, awesome, a request for a workshop tour. I would love to give you guys a workshop tour and I'll totally do that later. I've mostly tried to set up all my stuff here because I was a little worried I'd make y'all seasick if I started carrying you around too much, but definitely it's an amazing shop with some cool projects happening into it. Um, let's see, next question. Um, ah, cool, yes. More about the tour. Um, I do on my Instagram, the shop features heavily. My Instagram is at Thea Ulrich, my first name and my last name. So come visit me and ask me questions about welding and hopefully make some projects yourself. Question two, excellent question. What prevents the risk of um, elect um, get it, getting electrocuted? Um, all right, so electricity takes its easiest path. It wants to uh, take the path of least resistance to close the circuit. So if I have a ground clamp, I'll show you right here. A nice beefy ground clamp that's clamped to this nice thick metal table. And then I have the positive side of my circuit for MIG welding, which is my MIG gun. That will easily close the electrical circuit um, because electricity is all just going to go, again, the path of least resistance. Um, you can electrocute yourself if you get in the middle of that circuit. So I'll show you what that looks like. Harder to do with a big piece like this, but if I'm leaning against my table, holding a piece in my hand and I try weld it, you can see my body is what's completing the circuit. So you'd, you know, <laughs> definitely would not want to get into the middle of this middle of the circuit that way. And it's also luckily pretty hard to do. Um, so you're generally safe from electrical problems. Um, it's a little bit easier to electrocute yourself with TIG welding because that is a more challenging process and you can accidentally pull away from the table too soon and the electrode, um, the arc can jump to your hand. Um, it's happened before and you'll be fine if you do it, but um, fairly, fairly easily avoidable. The main thing you want to be careful of is not to be welding near any water um, or anything like that because as you all probably know, electricity starts acting real weird when it gets close to water. Okay, 
let's see question next question are toxic fumes created yes they are um so right now i'm in a well ventilated shop right behind you guys there's a garage door that's open and i have an industrial fan above me that's pulling out the fumes and same on the other side of the shop if i'm doing a lot of heavy duty welding i'll wear a respirator under my mask and same with grinding and stuff like that um, you can minimize the amount of fumes that are created by making sure you're welding on clean metal um, and uh, making sure that uh, there isn't any type of paint residue or oil on the metal. Um, so, uh, so that's the, that's kind of it for fumes. Um, another reason for wanting to weld on clean metal aside from fumes is because anything you weld on is going to get inside your weld um, and that will lessen the structural integrity of the weld. All right, another question coming in. Um, do I do metal working like power hammers and forging and stuff? I do. I've only used a power hammer a couple of times, but they are so amazing. They're awesome. You can get just huge slabs of red hot material and slide it into a power hammer and it will change the form of the metal so easily. It's wild. Um, but I also, I'm super old school and I love working with my hands. So I actually love kind of hand forging on an anvil. I actually got into blacksmithing before I got into welding, um, making lots of different artistic railings and stuff like that back when I was in school. Um, let's see, question, uh, next question, what sort of work keeps workshops afloat? Um, do people approach me for work um, or do I create stock of completed products or materials for other projects on hand? Great question. Um, everyone uh, figures out what they like to create um, uh, depending on what their preference is. I actually do a lot of work, um, production design and art art department work for the film industry. So I do a lot of custom builds that create the different sets um, on movies and commercials and music videos and stuff like that. I'm also a fine artist. So I have my own fine art practice where I actually build aerial sculptures that I perform on because fun fact, I used to be in the circus. Um, so that's how I get by. Um, a lot of the people at this shop weld barbecues. Um, this shop was part-time as a barbecue company, and so they're welding awesome custom smokers. Um, and so there's all sorts of different ways um, this comes about, uh, and people can make this work. A lot of people just like doing it for their art and being able to work with their hands themselves. Um, let's see. I have, um, let's see, I have a couple more questions coming in, and then, what project am I most proud of? Um, that would have to go back to my aerial sculptures. Um, so I make large geometric sculptures that um, often are kinetic. So they'll be moving elements to them that can lock into place. I usually design them to be able to take different types of loads so I can rig them in different ways. Um, and I love performing and being in the air. Um, the way I got into welding was actually by um, performing as a circus performer and touring around the states. And I just decided that I wanted to learn how to be able to create my own sculptures, my own objects, and my own set pieces. So um, definitely my aerial sculptures. All right, I'm going to get back and do a little bit more welding. Keep the questions coming in. I love it. I love to hear from you guys. And whatever you want to know more about, just let me know.
All right, so I have a couple more questions here. So I'm going to answer those first, and then I'm going to talk about the next steps for this project. All right, so I've heard the term forge weld used. What does that involve? Great question. Forge welding is when you create a weld while forging material. So what that means is if you're using a forge, like blacksmithing, um, you actually can weld the material together using a forge, um, which is very, very cool because again, remember welding, it doesn't mean that you're somehow gluing it together. You're actually fusing the material so it becomes all one piece of material. Um, to forge weld, you need um, a very, very hot heat. So it's harder to forge weld than a propane forge, much easier to forge weld than a coal forge because they have um, bigger, hot, more hot spots. Um, to get you up to that very, very almost white hot temperature you need to forge weld. Um, and basically what forge welding is vol involves is getting your piece incredibly hot. And then you use, um, you can use borax actually as a flux agent and you fold the piece over on itself, hammer it, flux it, fold the piece over on itself, hammer it, flux it, um, and um, keep hammering the material together and wrapping it together um, to actually over time fuse the material together. So as you saw with MIG welding, I pull the trigger and immediately I'm welding. So forge welding is much more labor intensive, but you can achieve the same um, results uh, by actually fusing the material together, which is just wild. Okay. Um, next question, am I using flux core or gas? If gas, what mixture? Great question. I am using gas and I am using 75-25 is what we call it in the industry. 75% argon, 25% CO2. It's the most common shielding gas that you use for big welding. Um, and again, the shielding gas is coming through and it creates a little cloud of gas around my molten weld puddle as I'm welding protecting it from the atmosphere and any contaminants in the atmosphere. Um, what flux core is, is um, it's a process where there's actually a flux core inside your welding filler material. Um, and the very hot process of the welding heats that flux up until it becomes this dense, fumy cloud um, that hangs out, again, protecting your weld from contaminants in the environment. Flux core is often used out of doors um, because it's pretty toxic, um, whereas, and it's also really messy, whereas shielding gas like 7525 is used indoors. Um, it's a much cleaner shielding gas, uh, and indoors it won't be blown away by a breeze. Um, next question, how did I make my, my table? How are all the holes cut so precisely? Um, uh, so this is a precision fab table. It's, I love working on this table. It's fantastic. Um, as you can see, I'm using these clamps, um, basically pushing into the table, going down and clamping into the table, which makes it really easy. Um, and I can align everything with these holes. Um, the way that we made this table is uh, we actually got it water jet cut, which is similar to plasma. Um, uh, in terms of uh, following a CAD file or getting something laser cut, but it's slightly more precise. Um, so we actually just bought the drawings, um, the files online, sent it out to get water jet cut. We got these parts back at the shop 
and then we uh, precision um, make the table so that we can do all of our precision work on it. Um, so that's my precision fab table. Um, OK, let's talk about next steps for this stool. I'm going to go in and I'm going to use an angle grinder um, to clear away um, all my gross looking welds. No, nah, I'm kidding. They look really good. <laughs> um, I'm going to clear away all the welds just because I want it sleek and kind of modern looking um, with that design. So I'm going to use that grinding wheel. You're going to see a bunch of sparks. It's super fun. Um, and then I have to put on braces across the top of the stool because I need to put a piece of wood in there. Otherwise, it will be very hard to sit down in. So I have these pieces of flat bar. This is still just mild steel. And I'm going to clamp them into the top of this piece and I'm going to weld them in there um, so that I can then again put a piece of stool in to put a piece of wood in to finish the stool. Um, I'm going to use a TIG welding process to do that part of the stool fabrication um, just so that you can see a different type of welding process and I'll be able to talk a little bit more about what that process involves. So I'm first going to grind and I'm going to clamp up that bar and then I'm going to set up my TIG welder and we're going to talk about what TIG welding is. As ever, let me know if you have any questions in the comments and uh, yeah, let's get to it.
All right, folks. I'm going to come back in for any questions, and that is not only an excuse to give my arms a break. <laughs> All right, so you just saw I was grinding away some of my MIG welds, make our kitchen stool super sleek and awesome. Um, and let's take some questions. Okay. Um, when you have cut pieces and still a larger gap between pieces um, than can be spanned with a weld, do you build up layers of your welding bead to close the gap? Um, great question. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, so it really depends um, because uh, structurally speaking, building up a weld over a huge gap, um, unless you do it in a very specific way, it won't be as structural as you might need it to. But if you have a huge gap in you know, a kitchen table or a chair or something like that, something that isn't going to be structurally tested in a very big or important way, um, then you can totally build up layers of weld to close up a gap. In fact, having a little bit of a gap in between your pieces when you weld is desirable because it ensures maximal penetration of your weld bead. So I'll show you with these two pieces. If I was welding these two pieces together, not only would I probably put a little bit of a bevel or a chamfer on the edge of those pieces, but I would leave about a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch gap in between them, and I would fill that gap with my weld bead and make sure that my weld was penetrating all the way through the piece. Again, make it as structural as possible. If you have a really huge gap, <laughs> um, which I may have had to close up in my day, um, you can take different strips of scrap material, uh, basically put a band-aid over it and then weld around that and so that you're actually kind of filling it with other material as well. Okay, next question. Um, how do you finish your projects? Um, have you ever gotten pieces galvanized or plate coated? Is it hard um, to get a company to galvanize a relatively small project? I will never spray paint in my projects. Great question. Um, so, uh, I often finish my work. Um, it really depends what it is. I love patinaing. Um, I am an artist and painter as well, so I love surface treatment of metals. And I really like using, you know, the chemical composition, the material properties of the metal itself to build up a really awesome looking surface. So I do a lot of patinaing. I spray paint. I have gotten pieces galvanized. It's not my favorite type of coating, but it's useful sometimes. And same thing with powder coating, useful sometimes. Um, it is hard to get a big company to galvanize or powder coat a small, a small job, because if you think about it from their point of view, they have a big oven that, you know, if you're getting something powder coated, they're gonna put it into the oven and they're gonna bake that coating on there. And so if they have a little piece or the oven's completely full, it's the same cost for them to run the oven either way. So your best bet is to call around companies and tell them the dimensions of your piece and see if, that, if they have room to slip it in with a load of other things that are being powder coated. Um, they're pretty understanding uh, for small jobs and stuff like that. Um, and that's worked out for me in the past. So that's my tip about that. Um, and see if they can slip it in with a bigger load. Um, next question. What is that octagonal thing behind you? Great question. So as I said earlier, if you're around, um, one of the things that's made out of this shop, the main thing I would say, are custom barbecue smokers. Um, so that octagonal object, if you can see it right there, is um, a, uh, bar is a um, backyard size of a custom barbecue smoker. Um, uh, the company here is called Fat Stack Smokers, and uh, their product is one of a kind. Um, so I personally love the octagon shapes. I've done a lot of welding and custom work for this company. I often come in as their TIG welder to do all the very kind of specific and harder, higher end welding jobs for them. So that's what that octagonal thing is. It's going to be a badass smoker. You can see the intake coming off the side there that's closest to you. <laughs> All right, let's get on with our project. Let me know if you have any other questions coming in. Um, and if I'm making too much noise and don't see your question, our lovely moderator will let me know. Um, 
I'm basically done with my finished grinds. I'm gonna go and do a little bit more grinding on this piece, and then I'm gonna clamp it up and prep those bottom joints for my tape welding process, okay?
All right, so as you can see, I have clamped up a brace at the bottom of this stool so that I can place my horizontal support for the stool and know that it's going to be perfectly flush right underneath the stool and it's held in place for me while I do the finished TIG welds. Since this is one inch tubing and I'm going to just be putting some three quarter inch plywood in there and this is three sixteenths thick flat bar, I'm one sixteenth off of having a perfectly smooth flush top. So I'm going to use a little welder's trick and use this 16 gauge welding wire as an extra little support and brace to make sure I get this perfectly at the right height so I have a flush stool top. Before I set up to do that, I have another question coming in. Coming in. How did I get started with welding? Um, no worries, all questions are awesome. Um, I'm so glad that you're here. Um, the way I started welding is a funny, weird story. Um, I actually used to be a professional aerialist and I was touring around the states with different circuses um, and I loved performing, but I basically slowly over time realized that I wanted to have more control over the types of sculptures and apparatuses and objects that I was performing on. Um, so basically I wanted to build my own show. So I actually uh, went to art school. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design on the East Coast and I studied um, sculpture and fabrication and building there. And that's how I learned all of these different tools and since have done a lot of large scale installation design and fabrication, um, event design and fabrication. And I also, for my own personal work, design and weld large scale aerial sculptures. They're usually ge large geometric sculptures. I still perform aerial on them. So um, it's my personal way of um, doing, <laughs> testing my welds and making sure they're strong is by hanging off of them high up in the air. So <laughs> hopefully that makes me a very good welder and not just um, a poor decision maker. <laughs> All right, let me know if any other questions come in. I'm going to keep on working on this stool. All right. All my magnets fell. One of my favorite things about working with metal is that you can use magnets to hold your pieces in place like clamps. It's amazing. It's Although the polarity, if it gets too close to your well, can mess with your well a little bit, so be aware about that. That has gotten me more than once.
So as ever, I'm going to do two little tacks with a MIG welder just to get this in place. And then I'm going to fire up the TIG welder, do some nice strong TIG beads on this, and explain to you more about the TIG welding process and what that entails. like I have some more questions coming in. All right. Let's see. Um, uh, just wondering if there's a place where y'all can check out some more of my work. Um, uh, abs absolutely. Um, my website is in the process of being updated. Uh, and that is my full name, DorothyOlrich.com. But uh, I'm pretty active on Instagram and I'm trying to be better about posting my complete projects on Instagram. And that's just my full name, at Thea Ulrich. Um, connect with me there. I love connecting with makers all over the world, seeing what kinds of projects are out there and uh, you know, figuring out interesting new design solutions to the problems and, um, in the world.
go on top. I'm going to do this finish well using a TIG welder. All right, a um, couple of questions come in and they all involve the TIG. Um, uh, so essentially, why am I switching to TIG welding um, for the horizontal slats on this uh, stool? It's simply so that I can show you TIG welding and talk uh, a little bit about how that process works and to make it so that you're able to witness two different types of welding processes. There's no actual need, um, but um, it's really fun to see a different type of process of weld. Um, and so this is my TIG torch. I'm undoing it a little bit so I can show you my piece of tungsten. That's what the T stands for in TIG welding. Tungsten inert gas. Um, so TIG welding is an electrical welding process similar to MIG welding. Um, and uh, so it, you close an electrical circuit, create that welding arc, very hot welding arc. You add filler material to make your weld nice and strong. With the MIG welding, that is all coming out of the same gun. But with TIG welding, I'm actually going to be manually dipping and adding filler material into my weld, making it nice and strong. And you have a shielding gas that's flowing through. But the shielding gas we use in TIG welding is 100% argon. TIG is essentially a little bit more finicky of a process and it's a lot more challenging to learn, but it gives you a lot more control over your weld arc and it's you are able to weld a lot of different types of things. So you can weld incredibly thin material with great precision, um, which is very challenging to do, um, but you're using a foot pedal to control your arc and the amount of amperage that's being output into your welding arc with that foot pedal. So I'm going to be using a foot pedal, dabbing in my filler material, and manipulating my weld pedal with this tungsten electrode. Tungsten is actually an element on the periodic table, and it is a super cool element. It has a lot of interesting properties, the main one being that it has a melting point over 6,000 degrees. So you can weld all day with this tungsten electrode with our super hot welding arc and it won't deform. Um, it will create a nice, precise, slim arc. I don't know if you can see that this tungsten is ground into a nice little point. So I'm going to slide my tungsten into my TIG gun. And I have a little bit of it sticking out. Another good thing about TIG welding is that it's a strong, it creates a stronger weld than MIG welding. Um, so if I wanted to make up an excuse for why I'm switching to TIG for the slats, it would be because I want a stronger weld there. Um, but this is a kitchen stool. It doesn't need to support cars or a bridge or something. It doesn't need to be TIG welded. Uh, I just want a TIG weld. Um, TIG creates a stronger weld um, for a couple reasons. One, it's a lot hotter. Um, TIG is electrode negative, which means um, your base material is the positive side of the circuit. Most energy flows towards the positive side of your welding circuit. And so about 70% of the heat and energy is in that positive side. So that's in your base material, getting nice and penetrated and hot in that base material. That also makes it a slow cooling weld. Um, and so as the weld cools more slowly, it's less likely to become brittle, um, which would lead to snapping. So TIG welds are more likely to bend before they break. And that's another you know, great, great reason to use TIG welding if you're concerned about the structural integrity of the weld. All right. up my welding table a little bit.
It's like a maze, shop maze. Filler material. All right, so now you're going to witness the ABCs of welding. That is always be comfortable. If you are not comfortable while you're welding, especially doing such a refined process like tape welding, you're going to start shaking in your weld puddle and your arc is going to go all over the place. So it's really important to set yourself up properly so that you can see what you're welding and you can maintain a nice steady movement throughout your welding.
saw that TIG welding is a really different process than MIG welding. Um, uh, it's funny because it uses the same things, electricity, filler material, and shielding gas, but it's much quieter. There aren't all those sparks, stuff like that. And it's a lot more tiny and refined. You can see me working really carefully to manipulate that weld beam. Um, it's one of the reasons that extra amount of control is why it can be used for things like um, very thin materials and exotic materials and stuff like that. Okay, look at a couple extra questions coming in. Um, I have a MIG question for you. Um, I know that when welding, it's important to track the shape of the molten metal pool. However, the nozzle is usually in the way when I look at it straight on. Any advice? Absolutely. Um, technique of how to see what you are welding and doing is one of the hardest parts of welding because you have all this personal protective equipment you have this hood there are sparks there's the mig gun in the way um so let me grab my mig gun All right, so technique while you're welding um, uh, involves a couple of different things. You want to maintain the same distance away. You want to maintain a your proper work angle and a drag or push angle. And your drag or push angle is what is going to help you see better. Um, there's also speed and heat settings and stuff like that. But let's talk about that drag and push angle because that's really important to being able to see properly. All right. If I were welding on this flat piece of material, my work angle would be 90 degrees. I wouldn't have any type of work angle, which is the angle that is perpendicular to the weld bead you are laying down. So this angle of my weld bead is going sideways. Um, but I would still have a drag or a push angle. So I'm right handed, I'm holding my gun in my right hand, I'm bracing it with my left hand to make sure it's nice and smooth action as I'm moving through the weld. Um, I give a 10 to 20 degree tilt away from my um, my face so that I can get my head, I tilt my head to the side and get it super close in there. One thing that I, I've taught welding for a long time, one thing I see a lot of students do is they're, weld, they're standing up here while they're trying to weld something. Watch me when I weld, my face is right in there trying to make sure I can see what I'm doing properly. So give yourself that angle and whether you're dragging as you lay down the bead or pushing, the angle is the same. And it makes it so you can tilt your head, get your face super close to your weld, and be able to see what you're doing. Welding is hard to see in general what's going on. Again, it's possibly the hardest part of welding is just seeing what's going on. So it takes practice to know what to look for. In the MIG process, there's also so much smoke and spatter and sparks and stuff. It is harder to fully see your pool. So definitely, if nothing else, try keep an eye right on that front edge of your molten metal pool. And that will be telling you um, what's going on in the pool pretty well and when to move and manipulate your welding torch. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions on that. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> You guys, I'm so excited about this kitchen stool. <laughs> I, I wish I had the wood cut, but I'm going to cut that later. And so in a later project, you'll be able to see what the wood looks like. Um, but uh, this is welded up. It needs to be finished. Again, to finish this, I'm probably going to put on a patina or some spray paint. I'll make sure to clean my, metal and my metal, excuse me, metal and scuff it up a little bit um, to make sure the paint or patina adheres to it. Um, but then I think it's going to look very, very sleek. I'm going to stand up on the table and uh, lean against it. Um, it's cool enough now. Um, don't do this at home, kids. Uh, but I was in the circuit, so I can't help myself but climb on things. It's, I think the only way y'all are going to be able to see the height of it. So I did it so it's 28 inches tall. I, I have no idea if you can see that. I can't see the screen well enough. But 28 inches tall, a nice looking kitchen stool. <laughs> All 
All right. So we are going to put this project to the side and get to start on our next project of the day. So this next project, we're actually going to be making a planter. Um, so one of my favorite things about welding is that you can imagine a new world or a world that you would like to live in. And so I thought, what if I lived in a world where I didn't kill every single plant I ever tried to take care of um, and I could make a planter for it? Um, so <laughs> jokes aside, there is one cactus I have been able to keep alive and it's in the shop now and I'm going to be making a planter to hold up that cactus. In, for this planter project, I'm going to be doing a little bit of welding, but I'm going to be doing um, a lot of oxyacetylene work and plasma cutting. And I wanted to do this planter as the second project because it will show you a really different type of fabrication than I did with the stool. With the stool, I was doing very precise measurement, measuring over and over again, keeping things square, making sure my angle cuts were right on. Um, whereas with the planter, I want this flowy and curvy and artistic. I'm going to be hot bending rod and curve it around. Um, and so it's a very different type of fabrication process. So I'm going to start with plasma cutting out a leaf, just so you can see the plasma cutting process. And then we'll go back to the table and I'm going to show you how I'm going to set up making this project. When you're doing something a little bit more loose and artistic, it's really helpful to kind of reverse engineer the project. So you're going to see I'm actually going to weld metal straight onto my welding table to make a support for that planter um, and put the plant right up on it. So they'll be the base of my planter and then I'm going to curve and bend, hot bend metal coming down to my table and at the end just cut out that middle support. So basically I'm setting up the planter um, so it's floating in the air on that support and then I can make the curvy sides. Um, so it's basically I'm working from the end of where I want the piece to be and working backwards. So it's a different type of fabrication process but it's a really fun thing to see how you can be precise about measurements um, and make sure something is going to be structural, the height you want it to be at, stuff like that, and also be able to be a little bit artistic and free flowing with what you're making. I'm gonna set up the plasma cutter now though to cut out some leaves because I want those curvy shapes to end in some cut out plasma cut leaves. I think that'll look really good. And also plasma cutting is a super fun process. So I'm gonna bring that piece of metal over here. I'm gonna hook my plasma cutter up. It's right here. I can twist it to show you a little bit. Um, so let's get going. Let's get plasma cutting. All right, so my plasma cutter set up. Um, let's 
So I'm going to use that plasma cutter to carefully cut out a leaf shape um, and experiment with some cool different shapes that uh, I want to use on my planter. The way a plasma cutter works um, relates a little bit to the way a welder works because there is an electrical circuit that you're closing, um, but it's different in the sense that there's this cone shape of the plasma cutter and essentially your electrical circuit sparks, you know, that arc of electricity and um, I have compressed, compressed air coming in through the plasma cutter and being forced into a very fast spiral inside this cone. Um, and that spark of electricity heats up that spiral of air, essentially creating a plasma jet stream. Plasma is actually the fourth state of matter, um, which is just so cool. <laughs> so um, you're able to use that plasma jet stream to immediately shoot and cut through your material. That jet stream can get up to 40,000 degrees. It's incredibly hot. And so it immediately blows, cuts through that material and blows out uh, the material from the back of it. So you're gonna be seeing, I might, roll this back a little bit and you'll see a huge amount of sparks and drops coming out of the back of the piece as I'm using this plasma cutter. Um, so I can see and draw out a leaf shape. I'm going to use a mixture of soapstone and sharpie. Um, sharpie to start and then I'm going to go over and soapstone. Soapstone is actually a really cool naturally occurring material that is also heat resistant. So it's used a lot in metalworking, especially with plasma cutting and oxyacetylene, because you can draw out whatever shape you want to be cutting or wherever you want to be bending it at, and um, it won't burn away once heat is applied to the piece. So since we keep working with very high heat, um, uh, you can imagine how useful that would be. Um, all right, so I'm going to lift this up so you can see it. Uh, I just kind of free-handed a leaf that I thought maybe would look cool, so I hope it does. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you can see that. <laughs> well, if not, you'll see it when it's cut out. you'll see while I'm plasma cutting is that um, I am no longer going to be using my welding helmet. I'm going to be using these super funky looking shade five glasses. Um, that's simply because the plasma doesn't create as bright of an arc as the welding arc is. So for context of what shade five glasses mean, um, sunglasses, so the sunglasses you usually wear um, are shade two, um, give or take. Uh, my welding helmet goes up to shade 13, and if you've ever tried to look at um, an eclipse of the sun, um, you know you have to look through something very dark about shade 13 to be able to look at it safely. And these plasma cutting glasses are shade 5, so they're kind of in between a welding helmet and your sunglasses that you wear every day. Maybe I'll just tilt this down a little. 
if you totally can't see the process that's going on, just let me know in the comments. But I think you'll be able to see some good sparks with this. Oh, plugging my compressor.
on the air compressor shut off, so I can answer your question more easily now. Um, re glasses versus full mask. Um, is UV not a concern with plasma cutting um, like it is with welding? Uh, nail on the head, um, plasma cutting emits no UV, so I don't need to be concerned about um, any UV rays or sunburns from plasma cutting. Um, so that's why I can. It's both not as bright, so I can use shade five, and I also don't have to worry about my full face being covered um, or risking sunburn. So, I don't know if any of you guys noticed. Um, I went ahead and made a total rookie mistake, um, and I was so excited to show you plasma cutting. I cut out the leaf, the outside of the leaf first, um, without cutting the inside. Um, as you saw, I just clamped it to the edge of my piece, so no big deal there, but. Um, <laughs> You definitely, pro tip, always cut out the inside cuts before the outside cuts, otherwise you're going to have to do some weird clamp setup like I did. Um, all right, hopefully you guys can see that. Um, so that's the front top side of it. On the back, you can see a lot of that gross dross that I was talking about. Um, you can hit a lot of that off with a chip and hammer, um, and it's actually best to hit that off with a chip and hammer as opposed to trying to use um, to grind it away or something, because that dross is almost pure carbon, um, so it would be an incredible amount of work to try and grind that away. So there's my leaf. Um, once I chip away the dross and clean up the sides, I think it's going to look pretty cool. Um, I'm going to do one more um, leaf, and then uh, port a, the laptop over to my table back there and we're going to start playing with some oxyacetylene. Number two. So I'm going to get the safety glasses. Oh, your protection. These earbuds are super long and bright green, and I think they make me look like Shrek. <laughs>
right, so it's very tempting with plasma cutting to just reach down and pick up the super cool piece you just made. Um, but do not do that. It is ripping hot and you will burn yourself. <laughs> um, here is the second leaf. Um, again, it looks kind of messy with all this draw sticking off of it right now, but I think cleaning it up and with a bunch of other curvy kind of organic um, structure to our planter, it's going to look awesome. Let's see. <clears throat> Next question coming in. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut off the plasma cutter. Try and minimize any ambient noise so it's easier to hear me. Um, okay, next question. How are you feeding the filler material? Is the torch doing this for you automatically? And with the plasma cutter, do you always have to start each cut from an existing edge? All right. Um, first, the filler material. Um, there is no filler material with plasma cutting. So when I'm MIG welding, the filler material feeds automatically. And cave welding, I have to manually add the filler material into it. Um, so it's different for each of those two welding processes. In plasma cutting, I have no filler material because I'm actually cutting. I want to get rid of material as opposed to add it. Um, which gets me to the second part of that question. Um, do you always have to start each cut from an existing edge? Um, the most important thing when you start a plasma cut um, is that you start um, over the material. Um, so it might sound obvious, but again, if you're cutting out holes like I did, or you want to be just trimming off or cleaning up a curve, um, you can start kind of half on, half off the material, but it does need to be near the material so that it has something to arc to. So you can either start at an edge and come into a piece, um, or you can punch a hole through the piece. Punching a hole through the piece can be a bit messy, um, and I can show you. So I don't know how well you can see that, um, but you can kind of see this is one of the pieces that I cut out of my leaf. Um, and I punched a hole through it and then I came out to that edge and cut around the piece um, because I want this edge to be as clean as possible. So I, I don't want to punch through right on the line that I want to be nice and clean. I punch through a little bit off the line and then I come out to the line to cut around. Hopefully you're able to see this. I don't know, but, and hopefully that makes sense. But essentially, um, you need to be able to arc to metal, so it has to be over the piece, and you want to just make sure that if you're punching through the piece, you keep it as clean as possible or away from your finished line. All right. Okay, so we have um, about, we have 40 minutes left. So I'm going to take you all over. Uh, we're going to light up the torch and start getting the oxygen settling going. Um, well, I'll set up the jig first, and then we'll light it up. And I promised someone a tour at the beginning of this, so I don't know if you're still here, person. But either way, I'm going to give you a tour. <laughs> um, and so you guys can see the shop quickly. Um, it's a great looking shop with a lot of cool um, projects and art going on in here. OK. Um, I'm going to have to move you guys a little bit. Uh, I'm going to try to do that minimally to, so I don't make you all seasick. Um, but I have set up my vise for oxycycline heating back there. So I'm just going to move some things around, pull you guys closer. In the meantime, if you have any questions, just let me know in the comments.
Okay. You get to see it easily. Look away. <laughs> Gotta bring my computer charger with me. How's that looking? Eh, good enough for our purposes. Uh, we can rearrange after. If it's not looking clear enough for somebody. Um, you so you can see the oxyacetylene set up quickly. Here's my oxyacetylene set up. Oxy is just short for oxygen, so I have a tank of oxygen and I have a tank of acetylene. Um, I am going to mix those two gases to produce an incredibly hot flame. The acetylene is obviously the fuel of my flame. Lucky for us, oxygen isn't flammable. We'd be in big trouble if it was. Um, so I'm going to crack open the acetylene. Um, I'm going to have some of that fuel feeding out. I'm going to light it. I have a flint striker right here. We like to use flint strikers when um, lighting up uh, different uh, things like acetylene and propane torches um, because it, you don't want to be holding a full thing of lighter fluid in your hand when you have a very flammable gas flowing out towards your hand. So just using a little flint striker is a great way to light that flame. And you're going to be seeing me adjusting the knobs a little bit. So I'm going to adjust my acetylene to adjust how much fuel is flowing out of my flame. I'm going to look at a couple things. I'm going to look at the smoke and try and make it so that my flame is burning as clean as possible. Um, and I'm also going to listen to it. You want it to sound kind of like a blustering wind. If it starts getting too high pitched, um, then you have too much fuel coming out. Um, and I'm also going to look for some visual cues of how the flame is shaped. The flame has different parts of it, from the envelope to the tip, and all of those are cues that tell you how much fuel is flowing out into your flame. Then I'm going to add in the oxygen. The oxygen is essentially a catalyst to this flame, making it burn that much hotter. Um, you'll see the flame go from yellow and blustery to blue and more sharp and refined and you'll know that oxygen is being added into that flame. I'm also going to use some visual cues to add the right amount of oxygen into my flame and then I'm going to have a perfectly balanced flame which is the flame burning um, at its most efficient and its hottest and the core of that flame gets to around 6,000 degrees so it's incredibly hot and um, you can use that flame to heat up metal and then manipulate and form metal as you want to, which is what we're gonna do. Since I just explained that to you, I'm gonna show you just what lighting up the torch and putting, lighting a flame looks like, and then we'll start setting up our actual project at the table. With oxyacetylene, you also only need to use shade five glasses. It does not emit any UV rays. Um, it is, however, very bright, so you wanna protect your eyes from that brightness. Um, There are different torches for oxycetylene. Um, getting my settings here. So there are 
are different torch heads. I'm using a rosebud torch head, which is going to make it so you see a big billowing flame. Um, there's also welding tips. This is the gas that you can do gas welding with, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and there are also cutting tips. So you can use a torch to cut through material, kind of like I just did some plasma cutting. Torch cutting is not as neat. You don't have as much control, but it can cut through thicker material if that's necessary. Um, so can be useful depending on the situation. All right, so my goal is to show you what this thing looks like and also not light my laptop on fire. So um, just cross your fingers for me. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Set that very small little flame. Adding more fuel. oxygen into my flame a couple of times there. Hopefully you were able to see the way the flame transformed as oxygen was added and then taken away. And you see how big that flame gets. Um, depending on your torch head, uh, you can control how large the flame is. We do some pretty heavy duty work in this shop, very thick materials. Um, and so <laughs> we have some pretty heavy duty flames set up for our torches. Um, but it's very fun to be able to play with that much heat and power. You can really um, manipulate and change the form of your metal with oxyacetylene. All right, so I'm going to tilt you back this way um, and come over to our planter station. Um, some of you asked me about my precision fabrication table earlier, which is what I was demonstrating on before. I'm moving to this table, not only because it has this vise here, but also because I don't want to put a ton of heat into my precision fab table. Um, if I do that, it will warp and it will no longer be precision. It will just be a fab table. This table is just some metal slats. It's the table we use heat with, so I'm going to be doing all of my hot bending work over here. This is the only plant I have never been able to kill. And for that, it's going to get an awesome stand. So I told you earlier I was going to be reverse engineering the making of this piece a little bit. This metal is just going to be um, this circle, the stand that the plant pot sits on, and I want that I want that to sit at 20 inches from the ground. Um, so I have cut this upright, just scrap piece of tubing to 20 inches less quarter inch the thickness of this material. So I know that'll stick up right at the height I want it at. This is not going to be a final part of my project. It's simply going to be the jig that holds it in place while I fabricate it. And that's what I mean by reverse engineering. With metal, you can add and subtract metal so easily by cutting, adding, cutting, grinding. Um, and it's just one of the things that makes manipulating metal, sculpting with metal so fun because um, you can kind of do it endlessly. Um, I'm going to weld this right to my table because, again, it's metal and you can do whatever you want. Bring my welding torch over here.
the maze, the workshop maze. Magnet, step right to the table. And I'm going to dig the pelvis right up. When I'm MIG welding, who here remembers which side of the circuit my ground clamp is? I'm going to give you a couple seconds to think on that. It is the negative side of my circuit. So now my table is all the negative side of my electrical circuit. And my gun is the positive side. All right, now we're ready to go. about when I say reverse engineer. Essentially, I have this captive set at the height that I want it set at. So now I can weld on this quarter inch bar, mild steel, which is what I'm going to be making this out of. I'm just going to tack weld it to the edges of that circle, wherever I want it to be. And then I can bring it down to the table. I can put any kind of curves or anything like that in it that I want. And I know that once I cut away that middle support, I'm gonna have a perfectly level plant holder at 20 inches tall, even though I did all this funky artsy heat bending on the sides. Hopefully that makes sense.
Now I'm going to try to bring you a little closer. Hopefully you can see that. So you can see, I just tack welded this quarter inch rod to my um, plate for my cactus holder. I did it so it stuck up a little bit because I'm going to want those sticking up just to make sure that my precious cactus does not fall off and hurt itself.
can see, when I move with my oxyacetylene, I move really fast. Once I open up the acetylene, I have to light it as fast as I can because if I take my time, a huge cloud of very flammable gas will fill the environment around me, and that's obviously a huge safety hazard. You can also see when I turn it off and start bending my material, I move really quickly then too because I'm losing heat from my metal and it will be harder to manipulate as I go on. So hopefully you were able to see that pretty clearly. As you saw, I took longer to heat up my material this time. I started with a little dot of um, yellow, orange to yellow hot metal, and I then extended that dot and would slowly pass over it. So I maintained heat throughout as I heated up more and more of the piece. Metal is going to bend where it's hot. So if you want a nice smooth, even bend, then you need to get smooth heat throughout. Metal heat goes from red to orange to yellow to white. And at white, it's essentially burning the metal. Yes, fun fact, you can burn metal. So I hope you're able to see, I had a nice kind of smooth, even heat. I turned off my oxyacetylene stuff as fast as I could so I didn't lose too much heat. And then I just did a fun little twisty loop to loo um, pulling it over to the side. So as you can see, Without my middle support, I would definitely not have a plant stand that could hold up a plant. But this is exactly what I'm meaning by reverse engineering, setting the constraints you want for your piece, and then being able to be artistic at the side, um, figure out stuff as you uh, build structure around your jig is a very fun, artistic, and creative way that you can make. All right, I'm going to heat a couple more of these up. Check. See um, if there are any questions. We have 15 minutes left, so I'm going to probably do one more heat and then give you that tour. Let me know if there are any questions. Let's get this fire lit. <laughs> I know you're laughing at my bad jokes. <laughs>
getting funky and curvy. Um, uh, as you can see, um, after done heating each piece uh, and bending each piece, I'm scraping away at the part that was heated up. Um, what I'm scraping away at is actually slag. Essentially, impurities in the metal that when metal is heated up, rise to the surface of the metal and form this scale over the top of the metal. You can kind of see it. It's called scale because it's just like this thin little coating. And you want to scrape that away um, while it's still warm because if it cools with the scale on it, it can kind of bake into the piece and make for a weird surface texture. Um, have a question coming in. Um, let's see. Is it possible to overwork, bend the metal in this case, um, or can you just readjust it as many times as want to need it? Excellent question. It is definitely possible to overwork the metal. Um, and uh, in both oxyacetylene bending and forging, that's a huge concern and something you need to be really careful about. Um, basically, every time I heat up my metal, um, I am changing um, the, its state. And even sometimes it's, it's like molecular state. Um, essentially, I'm making it more and more brittle every time I heat it up and it cools back down. Um, so I want to minimize the amount of times I heat it up as much as possible. Um, you can actually, if you heat the same part of metal up over and over again, um, and you're bending it and twisting it all over the place, you can actually end up with little micro cracks and sometimes actually just crack and break through the piece entirely. Again, it's getting hot, it's getting cold, it's getting hot, it's getting cold. It makes the metal incredibly brittle, so more likely to break. Um, this is exacerbated if you are dunking your metal to cool it off. Um, sometimes when forging or doing oxyacetylene work, you need to dunk metal because you need to, it to be cool quickly, or you dunk a little part of the metal so that you have one part that's cool and the other part that's hot, gives you more specific heat. Um, uh, but you have to be careful when you're dunking your metal because that um, exacerbates the problem and will make it so that um, the metal will get much more fatigued um, and much more brittle more quickly. So um, I could heat this up another couple of times, but after a certain point, I'm going to be making it so that my metal will get micro cracks and eventually break. Um, all right. It's looking fun. Um, I'm going to add one more piece. We're at, we have 10 minutes left. Um, I'm going to add a bow on one more piece. Then I'm going to walk you guys around the shop. Um, and 10 minutes left, so let me know if you have any further questions. All right. Welding helmet here. Got to switch back and forth between the PPE.
I'm going to do the tour now before we run out of time. Um, uh, let me know if you have any questions about the tools or, or processes you see in the shop. So as you can see, I brought a huge amount of tools over to this part of the shop just so that I didn't need to be walking around and I had everything at my disposal for these demonstrations. So you've seen a MIG welder, a TIG welder, plasma cutting, and actually settling bending. You've seen so many different processes at this point and a lot of those different tools. I'm gonna try rotate and do this smoothly and slowly. <laughs> So I've rotated around and now you're looking into the rest of the shop. Um, I'll walk out here. So as I said earlier, um, uh, this shop is often used to fabricate custom smokers. So what you can see behind me are a couple more of those octagon backyard models um, and also some big tank smokers made out of propane tanks. So I'm just gonna quickly walk you around the shop. You can see those. I'll point out to some different tools. You can also see there's a gantry back there. We built that ourselves because those propane tanks are very heavy. Okay, let's go. Okay, so there are some of the custom smokers that we make here. Um, that's a backyard model with kind of some off-road wheels. Uh, pretty hardcore. Um, walking through, you can see over here is where we have our drill press grinding wrenches, drill press, grinding benches, stuff like that. And here are some more of those big tank smokers. I told you guys we did pretty heavy duty work in this shop. This is what I was talking about. These are big, super thick tank smokers. Uh, you might see uh, Eric, who's the head pit smith at this shop back there. Um, he and I are quarantined together, so don't worry. We're practicing safe social distancing. Um, and uh, so we have some more smokers. We have a really big old school um, big welder right here. We have more tool bins. We have our material rack. It's really important that you um, uh, store metal sideways, otherwise it will end up getting warped. You don't want to lean it against a wall. Um, over here we have our horizontal bandsaw um, where we do a bunch of our cutting. And um, that's pretty much the extent of it. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a better idea. You can now see the totally insane setup I have over here for these videos. Um, usually these tools are much organized and set up throughout the shop, but I dragged them all over to this side so I could use them for these demos. All right, folks, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, thank you so much for stopping by this session. Um, I'm going to go and just do some hot bending for the last couple of minutes, but I wanted to thank you. Um, come back later. I'm going to be back here in a couple hours and for a little bit tomorrow. Um, tell your friends and, you know, reach out. I hope you uh, um, are inspired to maybe learn a little bit more about welding and metalsmithing and be able to think up projects and make your dreams a reality. All right. Oxyacetylene to bring it home.
plastic ceramic bending. Again, today we did pig welding, TIG welding, um, plasma cutting, and oxyacetylene bending. Um, a slew of different welding techniques um, for you to cut, weld together, and manipulate and form metal to make awesome projects. Thank you so much for stopping in. Have a great rest of your day.